Hello there. It's been five days of rigorous parliamentary sittings. It's about time we serve you with all you need to know about the happenings in parliament and in and around the house of legislature. This is the chamber. My name is Duke Mensopoku. We'll be back after this break. Parliament is still in the season for the consideration of budget estimates. This week, uh, various MMDAs have had their budgets uh, considered, and some of them have actually been approved. Well, this is the recap segment, so we'll bring you more of what has been happening in and around Parliament and on the floor right about now. The two potential Supreme Court justices, Justice Mariama Owusu and Justice Lovelace Johnson, took turns to answer questions on their background experiences at the bench as well as their future prospects at the apex court. The first to appear was Justice Mariama Usu, who debunked the notion that the mode of appointment and political opinion of justices have an influence on their judgments. She also espoused her opinion on the current state of legal education in Ghana and the perceived corruption in the judiciary. These days, uh, the way you hear people here called Supreme Court. So it tells you the confidence that um, people have at least in the Supreme Court. They've interpreted, you know, laws uh, that has satisfied, you know, people. They don't. They are not there because of their political. Power. We all vote, and we all have uh, parties we vote for. But we've sworn an oath that we will administer justice to all manner of people without fear of fear. And I guess that is the consideration that drives most of the judges. I can tell. The second and final nominee to be vetted for the day was Justice Lovelace Johnson. She labeled death penalty as terrible and called for urgent action on it. She further advocated for a sexual harassment policy to curb the practice. One of the most horrible experiences I've had is when as a new high court judge in 202, I was slated to sit at the assizes and I had to sentence someone to death. With that in mind, the judiciary is made up of human beings. We can make mistakes. Death is the end of everything. So what if we make a mistake and the person is already dead? For me, that's the basic, that's where I start from. Apart from the fact that the death penalty might infringe the rights of someone So the possibility that judges can make a mistake, the person is killed, only to find later that there was a mistake. For that reason alone, I'm anti the death penalty. The first Deputy Speaker of Parliament, Joe Seyusu, presented the report of the Appointments Committee to the House, indicating that the three nominees for the Supreme Court bench had been recommended for approval by consensus. Before the House passed the vote of approval, the Speaker addressed a few issues with the justice system in the country. This Honorable House approves the President's nomination for appointment as Justices of the Supreme Court. Justice Mariama Owusu, Justice Avery Lovelace Johnson, Justice Gertrude Araba Isaba Tokonu. I will also add my voice to congratulating them for rising to this great height. And it's important for us to note that this is a good example of recognition of meritocracy, devoid of gender bias in our country. First Deputy Speaker Joe Seyusu broke into ongoing deliberations about the budget estimates to announce the President's choice of nominee for the position of Chief Justice. Chief Justice of IAB Akufo is due to retire from the bench on 20th December 2019. Her 70th birthday in order to avoid a vacuum in the office of the Chief Justice following her retirement, I have decided to initiate the process for the appointment of her successor. To that end, by letter dated 2nd December 2019, pursuant to Article 1441 of the Constitution, I consulted with the Council of State on my nominee, Mr. Justice Eni Yabwa, Justice of the Supreme Court. 
who has been on the court for the last 11 years and five years on the Court of Appeal prior to that to succeed Chief Justice Akufo. The Council of State has notified me by a letter under the hand of the chairperson dated 11 December 2019 of the successful completion of the consultation process. Thus, in accordance with Article 1441 of the Constitution, I write to inform you that I have nominated Justice Enim Yaboa, Justice of the Supreme Court, for approval by Parliament as the next Chief Justice. Even before Justice Enim Yaboa appears before the Appointments Committee of the House for confirmation hearings, some legislators have been expressing their views on the appointment. Definitely, definitely the President has been making a lot of nominations and almost all the time he's gotten it right. So I believe that the nomination of uh, Justice Enim Yaboa will go a long way to promote um, justice in the country and also um, promote the judicial service um, in the country. I, I believe that now that we've gotten a new um, justice for the, um, the, the, as the Chief Justice, um, I strongly do believe that some of the lingering issues should be looked at so that we can um, bring finality to the issue of these student issues coming up uh, most of the time. And I believe that he's capable of looking at it. Bench. He's the most senior. But were they not appointed at the same time? That's the chair and he was the, he's the most senior on the bench. What does that mean? He's, when in the ranking, he's senior. To was he not were they not appointed at the same time by President Kufo? I'm telling you that he's senior to, to, to Aniyabwa. In fact, the, even at the time that they were appointing the Gloria what, what, no. Sofia Sofia Akufu, Akufu. Uh, the name came up forcefully. Mm -hmm. And I, I was given to understand that uh, the Chief Justice, who is about retiring, was going to short, serve a short term. And probably after that term, uh, Duce will be considered. Are you disappointed? I'm disappointed because it means that the chances of Duce are foreclosed. Because he's older than any of Since of my own, I am sure that he, he will work with the Judicial Council, the General Legal Council, and they will have their own vision. And I will not offer any vision of my own for him. I know for a fact that they were appointed the same day. Mm. They were classmates. Mm. They were appointed onto the bench, the High Court bench the same day, to the Court of Appeal the same day, and to the Supreme Court the same day. But at the bar, the two of us are called to the bar the same day. If your name is mentioned first, you're senior. Mm. Then I'm second, uh, you're senior to me. But that's all. It doesn't mean that they are, they, they, they are the same day. They are, they are contemporaries. During the routine budget estimate hearings, the committee discovered that the property to serve as headquarters for the National Peace Council had been demolished. The committee decided to visit the site of the demolition to acquaint themselves with the state of the development. Here is Chairman of the Committee, Seth Echampong. National Peace Council needed to be housed, so they go on with their mandated, statutorily mandated work. They were in the process of rehabilitating the structure here, and if you look around, this is old government property because all the people who dwell in this neighborhood are staying in their properties on behalf of the offices they work for for government so this is a public space unfortunately we had it yesterday in our hearing when we engaged the national peace council that other parties unknown because they could not give us any names so we wanted to see it first and for ourselves and lo and behold we came we have images of when the old structure was on, when they started with the expansion works because the rooms originally was not enough for the council. So they were going to add extra four rooms. And here we are now. The party we have no idea about have come to break everything down to ground zero. So we are charging the police service to take possession of the place because the place is under investigation primarily currently and we would not counter any other person trespassing on this property. 
ranking member of the committee, James Agaga described the development as disappointing. You see the structures around, dotted around, a similar structure was on this parcel of land. And so essentially what Base, uh, Peace Council sought to do was to redevelop that structure so that they would have more space, more rooms to serve as office. But the trespasser moved onto this land, pulled down the structure without an order of a court for possession. Granted that this property was even his or hers, he needed or she, he or she needed some order of possession to be able to do what the, the person did. So what has occurred here is an act of criminality. Back in the house, the budget estimates of some 147 million Ghana cities was approved for the Ministry for Works and Housing. Sector Minister Samal Atachia was clearly not pleased with the amount approved. Kaban for Structural Ministry, we expect that is a huge capital outlay that you need to do the jobs. But this is a physical space we have and we need to do our best to ensure that we give you the best. To the point that some MPs wanted the, the budget to be sent back to the finance ministry. That, that is a concern, a very huge concern. But I'm tempted to believe that when the material things are needed to do some good things for the country, especially in the area of flooding, I think the finance minister will be up to the task and uh, give us some more money. He also hinted of the latest plans regarding the Saglemi housing project. Public no. You see, because it will not be, with the greatest of respect, a kind of fetish that we should hide from the public. After all, the houses are intended for the public use. So why should we hold vital information from them? When, when will it be released? Well, let me just check with my chief director as to when the, the, the county surveyor that has been appointed via, I mean, the PPE arrangements will complete the job. And I'll let you know. So we had the very, very interesting arguments, deliberations on the floor of the house as well as outside the corridors of the house. But it's about time we take a break. When we come back, well, we'll be bringing you much more interesting arguments on the appointment of a new Chief Justice as well as other issues. This is The Chamber on City TV. We'll be right back. Welcome back from that break to the From the Floor segment right here on The Chamber. Well, this week, it's been a very, very, very interesting week of our constitutional, legal, and parliamentary affairs issues in Parliament. The House received the news of the President's appointment or nomination to the head of the Apex Court, uh, the, that of Chief Justice Enin Yabua. He's been appointed as the President's choice for uh, the position of Chief Justice. We'll be talking about that issue right here. On uh, the from the floor segment again various ministries departments and agencies have had to come to Parliament to defend the budget estimates some of them have been brought to the floor of the house and they have been approved well that of the office of the special prosecutor has become quite contentious because some members of Parliament especially on the constitutional legal and parliamentary affairs committee are questioning government's commitment to the fight against corruption based on the actual releases made to the Office of the Special Prosecutor, that office carved out uh, to deal with corruption that is involving people who are politically exposed. Well, this week, on this segment, we'll be speaking to two members of Parliament, one a member of the majority, also in government, and another from the minority, to test their minds on these two key issues that have dominated discussions in the hallways and corridors of Parliament, as well as on the chamber or in the chamber of Parliament. My name is Duke Bentopuk once again. I welcome to uh, the set the Honorable uh, Joseph Dindiok Bemka. He's Member of Parliament for the Timpani constituency. He's also Deputy uh, Minister of Justice and the Attorney General. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Duke. Next to him is the Honorable Roxen Nelson Eche Dapia Makpo. I hope I got, I, I got the pronunciation right. He's Member of Parliament for South Dai. He's also a member of the Constitutional, Legal and Parliamentary Affairs Committee of the House. Welcome, sir. So I begin with the issue of uh, the Chief Justice. The President has submitted his name uh, for Parliament to do, do its due diligence, um, look at the issues surrounding vetting, uh, forward approval or otherwise. 
First of all, what do you make of the president's pick for Chief Justice? Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thanks to your cherished viewers and your cherished listeners for this opportunity. First, let me congratulate the nominee, Sir Justice Enin Yeboah, for rising to that level from wherever he came. And let me say that His Excellency the President does not act in vacuo. He does not act arbitrarily. He is somebody who acts based on well-informed situations such as this. And so in the light of all the gamut of persons, the number of justices in the Supreme Court and etc., remember that the discretion ultimately is his yes. to be exercised. And I have repeatedly said that any such discretion given to you ought to be exercised in compliance with Article 296 of our Constitution. And he has done so. It is not actuated by any resentment and dislike of any person or, I mean, it's not capricious and etc. It is a decision he arrived at upon a careful consideration. And take it from me, he had to forward it to the Council of State. Mm -hmm. And the nominee came out clean. And so at that particular stage, the next step was to have sent it to Parliament, which he accordingly has communicated. I will say preliminarily that without doubt, and I have not heard anything since the announcement was made, he's a person of impeccable credentials and integrity. There's no dispute at that. And he's also a disciplinarian and a very strict judge. Nobody, and I repeat, the, the, the thing that hangs around a judge that may destroy the person's integrity may be the issue of corruption. And nobody, not a scintilla of such evidence, do I have against him. He's a very, very strong judge. And if you read his judgments and etc., you may disagree with him. But they are very, very strong judgments indeed throughout what I have read. So I will say that His Excellency the President upon the sober reflection and knowing them and uh, having looked at them carefully has made a choice. And that choice, I have not had any vehement opposition. It's a loud, loud welcome. Even when the announcement was made on the floor from both sides of the House. But, but, I think but, was but, uh, there was a very loud welcome. Uh, all right, but there have been some voices within Parliament itself. Some say there's a, uh, there's a senior to uh, uh, Justice Enia, but Justice Duce, his name also came up um, quite forcefully, and that he should have been appointed. No, you see, that is why I, I spoke to you about it. You see, there's nothing, no rule. In fact, there's no law. There's no legislation that says that His, His Excellency the President is duty-bound to appoint the most senior judge as Chief Justice. Then he has no discretion. If that were the law, then he has no discretion. All he has to do is to just say that, like, the law says, appoint the most senior, and this is the most senior, so you have been appointed. You, you understand? So the, the, the point is that he looks at them and upon considering a lot of factors to him, the person who is most fit. And remember that it, it's just like a car. You may have all the good drivers, 10 of them, 20, 100. But when the car is one, just one of them has to drive it. So the president has exercised a discretion. And as I have indicated, that discretion he has picked somebody who nobody has said that he's not qualified. And nobody has raised any issue, even though we haven't vetted him, in terms of qualification, in terms of integrity, and, 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 and moral standing, and etc. He served his nation at the High Court, at the Court of Appeal, and at the Supreme Court. And he's been serving at the Supreme Court for the past 11 years, you know. So there's no dispute about that. That he's qualified is not in dispute by virtue of all the criteria set for appointment to that high office. So I will say for now that I commend His Excellency the President highly for a nomination that has not brought up any controversy as far as I'm concerned so far. Okay, let me come to the Honorable Roxanne um, uh, Dapiamako. Um, first, what will be your thoughts about, you're also a lawyer, but probably might have appeared before him before. Um, what will be your, first, what do you make of the President's speak uh, of uh, Justice Eni Abouas, uh, Chief Justice, if approved by, the, by, by Parliament. Now, thank you for the opportunity and um, good afternoon to your viewers. Um, I'm highly conflicted in this matter because uh, Jaseni Ebuwa is um, like a father figure to me. Oh, really? He has a very, very close w working relationship with my former boss, um, Charles Haibo. Uh, A.K. Togbe Taprehudu. And so for all 
the years that I I spent at Haibo, Javin and Co, there were occasions where sometimes I was sent to Jansen for opinion, second opinion on matters. And if Togbe wanted something, some discussions, um, I will be the one he will send. And occasionally when I appear in matters before him, if he's a member of the panel at the Supreme Court, and when I, when I was done, and I, I pray for leave to, to leave their presence, normally that's how you do. As a lawyer, after your case is done, as part of the cases, you say that, my lords, may I, may I seek your leave to uh, depart from the court or depart from your presence? And then he will say that, my regards to Togbe. Okay. Uh, so, and personally, I've, I, he, he, he's mentored me in a lot of uh, matters. So, for me, it is it's a non-starter. Like he said, it's a very formidable judge who has very strong convictions of his opinions, legal opinions on matters. And he's contributed to the development of our jurisprudence, in, especially in, in civil matters, in settling the law, uh, desilting the law, distilling the law, refining the law, um, expanding the frontiers of uh, our jurisprudence in a lot of the areas. So, uh, to that extent, um, I have no problems. I wish him well. Um, his contribution to um, our jurisprudence, you see, that has been has been very in a very steady manner from almost for the past twenty years. Yeah. He came from practice. He was, I think, he was based in Kofodia. He came from practice. Was appointed first onto the High Court bench. You see that he's one of the few judges who spent just about a year on the High Court bench. And until and until he and Justice Doche did that, I think the record was also held by um, uh, uh, Justice Kobna Taylor, who also spent just about six months uh, at the Court of Appeal. He came straight to the Court of Appeal. So. And then, so after a very brief period, he was promoted to the Supreme Court. So a lot of the reasonings that and the and the formidable uh, dictums that we've come to um, appreciate were, were were decisions that emanated from his rulings at the Supreme Court. Okay. Now, the the controversy is this: why Duce uh, was not speak? Especially, people have, people have been mentioned ethnic balance. He comes from your part of the country. And uh, they've told the people at the and, floor, the top. Yes, been, and, and, I won't sit, and I won't sit here mm -hmm. and speak with an ethnic bias. Anybody who rises from the High Court to the Court of Appeal to the Supreme Court is qualified to be a Chief Justice. That is the barometer. So, as we speak, in fact, if the President wanted to be sensational, he could have waited for, the, for, for Parliament to pass the three nominees that he, he recently did. Yes. And out of those three Choose women, one. <laughs> select one. It would have been sensational. So that's the point I'm making. And in fact, the president could again nominate somebody from, from, from practice to be approved, to be appointed as a chief justice. Really? Exactly. Straight from practice. Straight from practice. No, no, experience, no yes. experience at the bench. No. Nothing. Straight it, from practice. Yes. To, to I be am chief telling justice. you. So, those, so those, those sort of sentiments have no basis. We should look at the caliber of the person who's been selected. The same, the same debates were made in 2008 when we were about to proceed to final year in the law school. We completed 209. When Justice Pegger then was, when, uh, yes, when Justice Pegger then was, yes, he was then the senior most. To in, in terms of acting capacity. But when President Kufo wanted to appoint a chief justice, he, as it were, overlooked him. Because why? Pega was also nearing retirement. So President Kufo settled on, on uh, 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 Mrs. Wood, Georgina Wood GSC, as she then was, who had then been promoted to the Supreme Court, I think just a year earlier. So that is why you see that it gave Georgina the opportunity. It gave Georgina the opportunity to serve in that capacity in excess of about ten years. 
You, you understand my point? Georgina had the opportunity to serve in that capacity for, for over 10 years as the Chief Justice, one of the longest services. Which brought some stability exactly. to, 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 to that Exactly. Order. So a lot of people were also of the opinion, were also of the opinion that the President Kufuado would have gone for somebody who was far younger when the opportunity came to replace, to find a replacement for Georgina Wood. But he went in for another good judge, who even though was near, had about a year or two to, to leave the bench, well, he settled on, on, on her. And so here we are, the opportunity has come. Justice Doche has just about a year to retire, uh, by, my, by my, the records that I've cited. So perhaps the president is also looking at the point that he wants somebody who could spend a couple of years more than, than the senior most will be acting. So for me, it's a zero argument in terms of those matters. When you are good, perhaps the only chief judge that we never had would have been Atububa. <laughs> I, I really would have loved Justice Atububa to have become a chief justice. Really? Yes, but, but for, for stroke of faith, yeah. uh, the opportunity never really arose. But he was such, he was such an erudite judge. Yeah. But, he was everything a Supreme Court judge. Okay, uh, you know, okay. But the, the point I want to add is this that the other issue that is brewing up now is that it appears we may have to abridge time in order to approve of the nomination. And it's something we must avoid. It may generate controversy. There's no need to rush. Let us do it in a, as, as, as we do it all the time. For the and that may create a vacuum. Uh, uh, no. So, so far, Kufu is no. retiring. No. So far, Kufu is no. going on retirement. No. 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 Yes, yes, yes. No, no, no. The most senior no. judge. No, no. I swear, if you brought this guy, that is the constitutional arrangement. That, that there's, in the absence of the uh, uh, substantive chief justice, the senior most chief, uh, Supreme Court judge who act. And, and it's, been, it's been followed. That is why even when the chief justice travels outside of the jurisdiction for purposes of administrative functions, the senior most judge acts. You know, sometimes they even go on sabbatical. So there's no vacuum. So you generalists don't even move that question. Okay. Don't move right. to the idea. Okay. Otherwise, it will fit. So far, there, there's no need for the appointments committee to rush. To, to rush. Wait. Yes. Next, next, next meeting. Yes. We do that. So that they do the publication. Mission. Memoranda are uh, invited. Mm -hmm. We vet the man. We vet yeah. the man. We vet the man. And then he will, he will shift seamlessly onto his new position and function. All right. We okay. don't have to generate any controversy. Last, last question on this issue. I, I want to find out from you what you think should be in terms of, of, of first, what do you think is the legacy of the outgoing Chief Justice and what should the new Chief Justice be thinking about in terms of... Oh, well, I have, justice I, have, justice. I have worked with the outgoing Chief Justice at the General Legal Council as a nominee of the Attorney General and I can tell you that that is a very strong character. Very principled, straightforward and when she has a conception of an issue views on legal education yes and when she, she she makes up her mind on an issue she will defend it to the last breath and i like the way she handles issues you see she says that 1 plus 1 plus 0.9 is equal to 2.9 it's not 3 so it, it around it up. yeah yeah, yeah. So she, she she's very very principled and I think that, you see, if you are handling such a high position and you are susceptible to manipulation or indecision, you can run it down. So I doff my heart for her ladyship, Justice of Ayakufu. She's done her best for this nation in a short period of her stewardship as Chief Justice. What I can say is that same will be replicated by the incoming Chief Justice, perhaps he will perform even better. But he concluded on a certain issue. This issue of rushing in terms of vetting, as he's indicating, that is a decision for leadership. It's for the leadership to it decide. It's a point where you have to squeeze and because sit on the, 20, is that, on the 23rd point of is that, December. The point is that the vetting that. will be done anyway on the said date. The only thing that will be the point of controversy will be that after the vetting, it has to be time for completion of the report. 
to be brought back to us for, for approval. Originally, we were built to rise on 20, Friday, 20, yeah. which was later uh, postponed to 21st. Saturday. Now, the question fundamentally is whether we can go beyond that to Monday. Because if we have to have the report and approve of him to be, uh, uh, to be sworn in, it will mean that after the Saturday's vetting, they have to compile the report over the weekend and submit same to plenary on, on Monday. But that, I don't know whether, uh, I mean, it has not been concluded. Leadership has so given the indication that if it's necessary for us to sit on the 24th, if you're on Christmas Monday, Day, or if you're on to, Day, to complete the business of the house, it says if so it is be necessary, it. <laughs> yes. If it is necessary yes, to, and I of guess. course, that is it. Yes. Because sometimes we can even be recalled at midnight yes. to come and consider some national issues of critical importance. So, yes, the vetting process is going to take place. That's the most important thing. And people are going to submit memoranda and etc. We'll do the proper scrutiny. And at the end, we'll have a chief yes. justice to take over. Okay. All right. If you have any words in terms of legacy, you should... You should. Yes. Uh, and regarding the legacy of um, the outgoing chief justice, um, should be... She's remembered for this famous phrase. Last production? No, the yeah, rules of courts. Oh, okay. The rules of courts as, uh, are supposed to be serve as a, a maid and not, and not as a, a master. And so it's supposed to help, help us to, you know, um, 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 uh, conduct uh, our, our cases in, in, in a way that we are supposed to. And then also... A position on bringing back the sense of conservatism to practice. I recall in 2012, I, I we had a matter before her, and I was we had concluded submissions. In fact, we had filed written submissions, and so she she directed that we, if we had anything to say, viva voke, and everybody was given 30 minutes. And so the 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 plaintiffs the plaintiffs council open uh, was given the chance to open his viva voke for 30 minutes when it was about my time apparently i went to court without my my week my week <laughs> she was in the <laughs> cj then she was in the cj and the the cj then that's georgina wood has had lax the rules so once you were in your gown and your beep and everything it was okay and senior judges were had been permitted. And when was my time to open my viva voki for 30 mm -hmm. minutes? That, so where's your gown? Mr. Hey, Defiame. Where's, 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 where's your gown? Mr. Defiame. Where's your gown? I said, oh, my lady, I, I, because of the laxity, the laxity condoned by who? I know I know your senior. Togbe won't teach you that. But you are already in flight. So next time, when you know I'm part of the panel, Don't come please, here without come with your gown. <laughs> <laughs> And we, so I, I wasn't surprised that when she actually got the opportunity to serve as the CJ, she reinstated, she, she varied that order by, by CJ Wood and actually reinstated the use of gown, wig, you know, what we call the proper apparel of, of beep. As for the beep, it's, 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 standard. It, it's part of the standing, uh, standing uh, apparel. But it is the gown sometimes that depending on the temperature in the room it's discarded as for the week for a long time even lawyers to the extent that sometimes when you were going to court we didn't pick it but she reinstated all that and directed judges to the extent that even at the magisterial level you have to wear your you have because at the magisterial level ask him we were going in tie we will just wear your you wear your suit and you are, you are in your tie you are you are good to go but she reversed all that so you see senior judges who haven't worn their wigs in ages. <laughs> now who appear before a career magistrate in, in wig and looking all oh, that, you know, I, that appearance that gives aura of, of law. So, yes, she has a very strong sense of conservatism. She, she loves the law. She thinks that the law is such a noble profession that it must never be allowed to be polluted any day. And so she says that there can be no difference between you, a lawyer, and a litigant when you are both in suit. You know, but cases are supposed to be extended to lawyers. So don't qualify. All right. So let's 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 come to another issue that you made popular this week in the House. Um, the Constitutional, Legal, and Parliamentary Affairs Committee is considering the budget estimates for various statutory committees, uh, um, agencies, including that of the OSP. 
a bill which is the baby of this current parliament. Yeah. Now you have had cause to complain about the budget, uh, the budgetary allocations and the actuals released yeah. to the office, yeah. and to extend question the government's commitment to the fight against corruption. What is the basis of this of this argument? Now you you recall that as part of the Trump cuts that the government flashes around is the establishment of the the OSP, and so. Yes, it's good. Uh, as as be, being a member of APNAC, African Parliamentarians Against Corruption and all that. And for the fact that I was very active and participated actively with him in the passage of the law, I, I look forward for that office to flourish and function in the manner that we envisaged. So I was hoping that, for instance, by this time, we would have regional offices would have been established to the point that we'll be making efforts to set up district offices but it turns out that in the first year of its full flight operations which is 2019 the budgetary allocation of 180 million in excess of 180 million um the 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 as approved was actually not released what was actually released per his own report presented by the minister of finance and you've already met him i suppose yes right? we met him yesterday the Minister of Finance was 28.87 million. Now, when he brought his own report, and that as a supplementary to the report, the estimate report brought by Minister of Finance, it, it the revelation is that he was he was actually given 5.7 million out of the 180 uh, million. Yes. He got five. Not, seven, not even up to 10 million. No, five. And here is the and here is why. The why is that. The man says he's been placed in a very limited space to operate. So his office accommodation is said that he can't do anything. He couldn't do anything. He couldn't recruit. He couldn't even take people on secondment to. So he has only three investigators that he operates with. So in effect, the, his current situation, the circumstances of his current situation is such that he's, he's unable to to perform efficiently. So the, the revelation yesterday was that the president has directed that this new get fund complex, the 10-story get fund, that get fund has constructed to be their flagship office, should rather they should stay, get fund should stay where they are now, and this structure be given, be allocated to the office of the special prosecutor. Yes, that's the directive. And so to that extent, I, I appreciate the gesture of the president. But why do we have to allow this to happen? When indeed you could rent commercial premises to let him function, because a lot of the agencies... Maybe at an extra cost. Yes, but other agencies have come to us who, for lack of available public office spaces, have rented so that they can deliver the public service for which they, they've been established to perform. You, you see the point. So... For me, it, the, the conduct of government in this matter tells me that they are not committed. Okay. But to hear yesterday from him that the president has directed that the new get fund office be allocated to him, even then there are structural issues. Yeah. So they are trying to tidy the place up for him to relocate. So we'll have to monitor how his performance um, 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 pans out yeah. in 2020. But so far, he's handled only two cases. It's filed only two cases and pursue only two cases. Okay, let me come let me come to the deputy attorney now. 180 million, 28 released, actually 5.7 released to the two. Does this not does it does it not tell us a story? When we get back to the budget, what was supposed to be released to that particular office, you realize that a chunk of it was for Capex. Yes, a chunk of it was for Capex. And because of this agreement to give a different building, that's why the money was to allocate to um, to allocate a different building. Then there was no way that the same money could have been spent building another place. Okay. So that 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 and if you you look at the amount of money spent on that building vis-a-vis -vis the 180 million, it is only the difference that we have been talking about now, because that that problem that the money was earmarked to to, to solve has been solved anyway. So we, we should look at that. And that's why I do agree with my brother, because he concedes towards that area, that yes, once that accommodation has come up, 
it will have to go into but, 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 the amount of compensation is yes. compensation and compensation we i mean i think that the office has not complained anywhere that compensation of employees has not been but, yes but the report it says but nil. the report the report from minister of finance says nil and the difficult he explained a lot of the staffs that he has are also on secondment. They are on secondment. They are also on secondment. So they don't have their own staff. So why do you release money for them? That's not problematic. If, if, no, if, 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 are you aware? If you have officers on secondment to such a critical no, 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 office, no, 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 like hold on, hold a special on. prosecutor. You are not aware that an advertisement was made when they, and they, are, they are going to recruit. You are not aware? They advertised. And people applied. And they are now going through the process of recruiting their own permanent staff. I'm aware of this. They, yeah. It was done in the dailies, the national dailies. And they're going through the process to recruit. So when he's going through the process and recruited the staff competent and qualified to man their affairs, at that particular stage, they will have enough of compensation Let of employees. Let me clarify. Yes, yes, my brother may be, may be privy to this. But what came up yesterday, which then compelled me to, to ask questions about the activities of the board, because the board has been inaugurated. The man complains that he's not even able to buy operational vehicles because there is procure procurement issues are in abeyance because the tender committee has not been established. And these are decisions that the board, the board is supposed to, you know, give policy directions. He's, un he's, he's unable to do that. And these are the difficulties. And, and again, if you look at, again, if you look at the advert that you speak of, he, they are not able to proceed because of procurement the man is so he's so sensitive to procurement issues because he he said that he has to prosecute people for yeah, procurement. exactly so you see the dilemma in which he finds himself he says that i am going after people for 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 no for for committing corruption and corruption related mainly through procurement process so i must be very careful how i apply money so yesterday he jokingly said even the 5.7 million a chunk is sitting in the account so when 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 uh, the honourable uh, Babian Samoa asked that why are you not spending the money, he says I will be hard, I will be very happy if you can come and spend it for me, <laughs> jokingly, because he's so afraid. He thinks that everything must, every system must be in place to function so that he will take off. See, but but uh, he doesn't uh, want to do anything arbitrary. Agreed mm -hmm. with what uh, my, the way my brother has uh, submitted. But the point is, it has no point to government's failure to do anything okay the, the, the inability to put up i mean this entity tender committee and it is no government that will come and put up that it is the board that will have to give poli policy directly so in effect and the then, government's government's commitment towards government's fighting corruption government. commitment towards offices unwavering there's no doubt about that and you 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 you, you even you, you can imagine that a project that was meant to forget fund has been given that colossal sum that has been spent there it's his excellency the president prioritizes that because why because get fund as we speak now is not operating from the streets. <laughs> they are not operating from the street. They are operating from a building. So for the meantime, remain there while this critical uh, office of national importance moves in there, so that we will move on from there. But I can tell you that the complaints he's talking about, which relate to entity tender committee and etc., are all things that are supposed to be done by the office itself and put in place. But you know, you are right. The venerable Matera Mido. With, and uh, I don't think that I have to add apologies. He, he, he's, he's trying to run the office in a near perfect manner because he is going after others. So before you can point accusing fingers at others, you must examine your own bit. So that's why he's unable to make certain moves, certain administrative decisions that are supposed to be taken to ensure that he moves forward. He's thinking about the consequences. And remember, that if he commits any error in that office, then everybody will say that. Ah, but if you are going after everybody and you yourself you are you are doing A or B contrary to law, then what, what are we what are we thinking about? Are okay. we safe in that situation? So he's extra cautious. Okay. My advice, lastly, and I want to plead to beg leave of you. Yes, we are, is we are that, having that. In that, all of us to give our support. And my brother has rightly pointed out that myself and him were pivotal in the passage. And I, I mean, he was even, at a point in time, he was singled out and commended yes. among the people who actually worked so hard to ensure that this deal became law. I even went out of the country to so many places, through consultations and look at their systems and all that. So we have actually, I mean, you could not have interviewed any other person uh, to find an opinion on this issue. And I would like to say that we should just give more time 
the office is being set up and things will get right. Ghanaians should not panic. All right, so that's how we wrap up uh, this segment of the program. Uh, 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 the Honorable uh, Pemba has to, has, to, has, to, has to leave. Yes, yes. So that's how we wrap up uh, the, this discussion on this segment of the program. We'll be back after this break. I had with me the Honorable Roxin Dafiamapo and the Honorable Joseph Pemka. We'll be back after this break. So you're welcome back from that break to uh, this segment, Duke's View, where I get to share my opinions on the major issues that have transpired on the floor of the House. Well, this week, just about two things that I would like to talk about. But they're all grounded in the fact that as of now, uh, this House has still not seen and approved the revised standing orders. From whence cometh my agitations for this week? Because if the revised standing orders had been approved by now, all these two issues would have been addressed. But as we speak, because the revised standing orders have not been approved, or they've not even come to the floor of the House, talk more of even being approved, these have become contentious issues uh, that have brought about certain ripple effects which has affected proceedings in the House this week, in my opinion. So first off, is the matter of opening up of the committees of Parliament to the media. Now, under the revised standing orders, as we've been told, when they come into force, media men will be allowed, not just media men, but the public will be allowed into the committee sittings of parliament. Now, a very critical business is going on, or has been going on for the past two weeks in parliament, which is the budget hearings, or the budget estimate hearings, where the various committees of parliament have been considering budget estimates from the ministries, departments, and agencies. Now, critical work is going on in all of these committees. Now, what the public sees, or what the public is fed with, is what happens on the plenary when these committees are finished scrutinizing the various budget estimates and they bring it to the floor and journalists see, the public see, and then by extension, the whole of the country gets to see what is happening in parliament by way of these budget estimates. One of the cardinal functions of parliament is what we call its power of peace or the power of peace function, which tells or which says or which makes us aware of the fact that parliament is responsible for the spending or for approving government spending. And in doing its work in that regard, it's been meeting various ministries, departments, and agencies. I think that it will be in line with greater transparency and accountability to have had these committees opened up. Because this week, we've heard some stories, I mean, about the actual approvals of the Office of the Special Prosecutor and the comments that the Special Prosecutor had to make when he faced Parliament's Constitutional, Legal, and Parliamentary Affairs Committee. Now, if the new standing orders had come into force and the public members of the public and, by, and journalists had access to these committee sittings and committee meetings, we would have witnessed firsthand some of the things that went on at that parliamentary sitting or that committee sitting to know what exactly is entailed, what the challenges of the special prosecutor are, instead of the second-hand account that we get or we are fed with when the reports come onto the floor of the House. Usually when you listen to the debate that goes on with these budget estimates, Sometimes the MPs are reading from certain documents that the public is not privy to or journalists are not privy to. They are not privy to these documents because these are documents that were served at the committee level, of course, where there were no members of the general public, where there were no journalists, where there, were, where there, were, where there was nobody apart from the ministry officials who have invited and the MPs themselves who are there to look at these documents. I think that one of the reasons why these revised standing orders must come into force as soon as possible is for that provision which will open up these committee sittings for members of the general public to witness and see for themselves at first hand what is going on in these committees with regard to a critical function like the budget estimates so that account by account, blow by blow, Ghanaians and journalists for that matter will see how these things are being scrutinized. That's number one. Secondly, another critical issue which came up in Parliament this week was, you know, the observation, the uh, appointments committee sitting uh, for the um, vetting, for the vetting of three justices who have been nominated. Well, they have been approved by the House. But one of the provisions of the new standing orders, if approved, is for specific committees to vet specific appointees of government. So, for instance, this Supreme Court judges 
would have been vetted, or these Supreme Court judges would have been vetted by the Constitutional Legal and Parliamentary Affairs Committee, as well as the Judiciary Committee, for, for crying out loud, some of the questions that came from members of parliament mm, to these judges leave much to be desired. I'm sure that the members of the Constitutional Legal and Parliamentary Affairs Committee and the Judiciary Committee, if they are the ones who had vetted these justices, would have gotten more out of them than, I'm not saying that the Appointments Committee did a bad job, but I'm saying a better job could have been done by the members of the Constitutional Legal and Parliamentary Affairs Committee, as well as the members of the Judiciary Committee, because going on to the Supreme Court bench is a technical area for people with a certain technical expertise. So lawyers, paralegals, people who have been in that field. Of course, that, that does not mean that a layman or an ordinary mind cannot ask critical questions. But, but, but just to allow for expertise at play in Parliament to work. That's so why I'm saying that the second provision or the provision which allows for specific committees, that's why Parliament in its own room has even seen that this omnibus appointments committee creation, which is interested in vetting um, from archaeology to zoology, from every subject area or sector of government with the same people, it's not helping. So I'm saying that it's about time that we practicalize. We have this revised standing orders kick-started, brought to the House, approved, so that some critical provisions, these two that I'm taking today, the opening up of parliamentary committees for the public and for the media to report, and also for the specific committees in which, in, in, in this case, the Constitutional Legal and Parliamentary Affairs and the Judiciary Committees would have vetted these nominees of the President going on to the uh, Supreme Court bench, and even now the Chief Justice, who has just been appointed, so that Ghanaians will get better quality or quality in terms of the output of MPs from these committees that are supposed to serve the people. This is my view for the week. And that's how we wrap up this week's edition of The Chamber right here on City TV. My name is Duke Mensopoku. Enjoy the rest of our programming. Keep watching City TV. <laughs>